All right, now I'm gonna uh, show you how to solve the constrained least squares problem. Um, actually, it's gonna turn out to be very much like the least squares problem uh, that will reduce it to something that involves our old friend, the QR factorization or solving linear equations. Uh, let's see how that works. So we'll start with a derivation uh, from uh, calculus. Um, that is if you remember this, but it, it actually, after this, I'm going to give you a derivation which, frankly, I find much clearer and is much simpler. So, uh, but we'll start with this one because it's traditional. And after all, most of you or many of you were already tortured by, you know, by taking, having to take a calculus class. And so we might as well go back and, and use, uh, use what you learned there. Okay, so um, what calculus says is something like this. It says, if you want to solve this optimization problem here, uh, then what you're going to do is you're going to, produce something called the Lagrangian function. That's named after a famous mathematician named Lagrange. In fact, I think his name already came up once already uh, in Lagrange polynomials, for example. Okay, so and what, what the Lagrangian is this, is this, is you introduce these numbers, uh, z1 up to zp. Uh, these are called Lagrange multipliers. Um, and it says that you should take the objective function here and you should add um, that's the constraint. These are the these are the constraint residuals. These things c1 transpose x1 is d1 up to cp transpose x1 is dp, and we multiply those by the Lagrange multiple, and that's the Lagrangian. Okay. Now, um, anyway, then then what you're told is this: is the optimality conditions are simply this. You take the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to xi that has to be zero, and the partial derivative with respect to all the zis have to be zero. Okay. So. Um, I actually remember being taught this and having absolutely no clue what it meant. Um, I don't know that I actually really learned it until maybe I was in grad school or something like that to really get it. Um, now in this class, we're not going to get in, we're not going to get into what it really, what, what it is. Uh, so we're not going to do that. Um, but you know, if you take a course on optimization, maybe, that, maybe at that point, this will become clear. Um, and in fact, it's funny because it's actually normally just taught as a set of behaviors or tips. It's like, you want to solve that? Fine. Form the Lagrangian, set the partial is equal to zero. And if you ask why, they're like, just do it. So, okay. That's, that was my experience anyway. So if you feel the same way, that's fine. Okay. Um, so let's look at these conditions. Well, the first one says I should take the partial, the second one, I should say, takes the partial with respect to zi and set it equal to zero. And if I take the partial with, with respect to, say, z1, I simply get c1 transpose x minus d1 is zero. Uh, okay, so I get these, but we knew that, right? That's the constraint. That's so we knew that that. Okay, so the, so the the second set group of of uh, of equalities, the partial derivative of L with respect to the zi's, is just basically reaffirming that we can't. We have to choose something that is uh, feasible. Okay, now the first n equations are those are more interesting. That's the partial derivative of L with respect to xi. Um, and when you go back and work out what it is, we have to take the partial derivative of L with respect to xi. And you can see there's, a, there's contributions in here, but there's also contribution in, in here. And that's actually a calculation we did before. I'm not going to do it right now, but it turns out to be exactly this. It's 2 times the sum of a transpose a ij x hat j minus 2 a, a transpose b uh, sub i plus this. These are the terms that come from those other terms, uh, the, 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 the other terms where the dual variables are, the Lagrange multipliers. That's this thing. Okay. Um, in matrix vector form, you get this equation. That is going to be, that's the second set of, of, of equations that have to be satisfied, you know, when you take the, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian. Okay. So <laughs> this one I can write as Cx hat equals D. And this one I write this way. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect this equation, it, equations, system of equations, this set of equations, and I'm going to collect them into one big equation for both variables, the x hat and the z. Now, the truth is, we don't care about the z. I mean, I mean, in some applications, you do care about the z, but that's beyond the scope of this course. We don't care about z. So z is just something you have to calculate in order to get x hat. So that's fine. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll calculate x hat and z, and then we'll just throw away z and use x hat. So, all right. So let's see that I've done this correctly when I stack these two equations. Well, the bottom equation is c. These are block multiplications I'm doing now. c x hat 
plus zero times z is d. Oh, so the bottom one just says is this, okay? The top one is 2a transpose a x hat plus c transpose z equals 2a transpose b. Hey, that's exactly this, okay? So this, 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 this set of equations here uh, expresses basically these, uh, these Lagrange conditions. The Lagrange conditions are, well, these things written out in a general form with the partial with respect to xi is zero, partial with respect to zi is zero. Okay, and we get this. And these equations <coughs> have a name. Uh, they're called the KKT or Karush Kun Tucker. These are three mathematicians um, who did some work on this. Actually, what they did was something much more sophisticated with inequality constraints. But nevertheless, we would call these the KKT or Karush Kun Tucker uh, conditions. Um, and that's a square set of n plus p linear equations in the variables, which indeed have size n plus p. So that's a square set of n plus p equations with n plus p variables. Um, and one very good way to think of this equation is it's a generalization of the normal equations for least squares to constrain least squares. So remember that the normal equations were something like a transpose a x hat, you know, equals, you know, a transpose b. That, that, these are the normal equations. And that's actually, that's what this equation comes down to um, if you remove c. I mean, that's what it is. You divide by 2 as well. So, so you can think of this as, this is, this is the KKT equations are the, um, the extension of the normal equations to constrained least uh, squares, right? So that, that, that's what this is. These are called the optimality conditions or something like that. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is very cool because, um, you know, what we've done is we have reduced solving uh, a, a problem that we didn't know how to solve, which is constrained least squares problem, um, to one we do know how to solve, which is solving linear equations, right? So <coughs> that's, 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 a, that's kind of our trick. The truth is we kind of did it with least squares as well. So, okay. Now, assuming that that KT, KT matrix is, um, is invertible, um, then you just solve for x hat and z. You do something like this, um, and that's the solution. Now, we don't care about z, um, but we, we do get x hat, and that's great. So we have a way now to solve, uh, to solve constrained least squares uh, problems now. Um, I mean, one simple method simply takes that matrix and just solves it, I mean, which you could do by, for example, QR factorization of that. Now, you might be interested in when this matrix is invertible. And that really means when is your constrained least squares problem sensible, roughly speaking, right? And uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but it comes down to this. C has linearly independent rows, and then A stacked on C has linearly independent columns. And, and you'll see that this kind of... Well, first of all, it implies something about the sizes of various things, right? Um, it says that the number of linear equations has to be less than the dimension of the variable. Well, sure, okay. In other words, the CX equals D equations have to be underdetermined or square. If they're square, it's a bit silly, but because <clears throat> you just solve it and then that's your answer. Um, and the cost of computing it, uh, there's many ways to do it. One is just to solve for this thing, and it's basically like N plus P cubed is, is what it is, right? So, um, that's, that's how fast you can compute it. So, okay. Now, what I want to do now is give what I think is a far better uh, derivation of the solution of the constrained least squares problem. Um, and it uses nothing but like the most elementary matrix vector notation and deep mathematical concepts like, you know, the sum of two non-negative numbers is non-negative. Okay, so I, and it also doesn't require any faith. Uh, the truth is, if you go back to this <laughs> to this story, this Lagrangian story, um, we were lucky in that there was only one solution of these, right? It's the KKT system or something like that. But in general, uh, the real story in calculus goes like this. Um, you can find points that satisfy these, which are not optimal, right? So, Roughly speaking, this Lagrangian method says, I can give you some candidates, and then it's your job to go figure out if they're actually optimal or not. That second question, actually a lot of people don't even, they forget about that. Um, here, this will just be a completely independent verification, very elementary. It goes like this. 
<coughs> so I'm going to show you that x hat is a solution. X hat is is this one. It's the one that says it's that. It's the x that it's this one given by this. I'm going to show you that's the solution. Okay. To do that, I'll say suppose x is any vector at all that satisfies cx equals d. So you we would say any feasible vector satisfies the equations. Okay. Then, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that the norm squared of ax minus b is bigger than is bigger than or equal to the norm squared of ax hat minus b, and then that'll show immediately that that's that my x my alleged x hat a solu my alleged solution x hat is really the solution. Okay. So norm ax minus b. I do the same trick we did with least squares. Um, I I take that and I do something silly. I add ax hat um, and I, I add ax hat here. Okay, and I subtract it, which is silly. But now I'm going to use this formula for uh, the norm squared of two vectors. It's the norm squared of the first plus the norm squared of the second, and then plus two times the inner product of the vectors. So <coughs> the norm squared of the first is this. Norm squared of the second is that. Um, and then I have this. I have this inner product. That's the inner product of the two vectors, twice the inner product. Okay. Now. What we're going to do is we're, going to use, we're now going to use, so far I haven't used anything about x hat, but now I am. x hat satisfies this equation, right? Because that, that's the first row of the KKT system, okay? That's the second row. Um, and cx and cx hat both have to be d because they're both feasible. That's our assumption. Well, sorry, x hat is feasible by construction. x is feasible by assumption. Okay, so what this says is if I look at this inner product here, and I work out what that is, I get 2x minus x hat transpose here. I'm, I'm pulling the a out here and then putting it over here to a transpose. Then I look at a transpose times a x hat minus b. That's right up here. That's c, and I get this thing. Um, and then I go over here, and I get minus c times x minus x hat. Now, cx, I can tell you this, cx is d. cx hat is d because they're both feasible. So c times x minus x hat <coughs> is actually, it's d, it's actually d minus d. So that's, this thing is zero. Um, and that says, this, this thing is just zero, it's just gone. And then what this says is that the norm of ax minus b squared uh, here is, it is actually equal to this. It's the norm of ax hat minus b squared plus, and then this thing is non-negative. So that means that it's bigger than this. So I'm done. So, which is kind of cool. So that's uh, that's it's that simple. It didn't use any anything complicated. So that's a direct verification that the solution of the constrained least squares problem um, is given by this, right? This this is and this is a formula, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you could you 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 can compute it. Uh, many things uh, actually, a lot of linear algebra packages would have a, a function that would solve the constrained least squares problem. Um, well, you can write one yourself, and it's about two lines long, right? It just sets up forms the KKT matrix, then, you know, solves it with, you know, backslash or something like that. So, okay. Now let's turn to the least norm problem. We'll see a, a, a beautiful thing emerges and something pretty cool that ties a lot of the stuff we've seen together. Um, so the least norm problem says minimize norm x squared subject to cx equals d. Well, some pretty cool things happen. Number one, when we form the KKT matrix, which is this, um, it's actually, if assuming C has independent rows, uh, this matrix is always invertible. Uh, so because I stacked on top of C uh, has independent columns, I mean, of course, because of the, if you look at the I on top, um, we're, we're going to assume C has independent rows, and that says you get this. Um, now, here, uh, this system, generally speaking, when you see a, a system of equations, the right thing to do is don't try to solve it by hand. Mistake. Let a computer do it. Okay. Now, there are exceptions. Sometimes when something is simple enough that, you know, well, this is a case of that, um, then it's time to get out your pencil and do some algebra and stuff like that. Now, um, here, the first equation uh, says basically 2x hat uh, plus c transpose z equals 0. And that tells us that x hat is minus one half uh, c transpose z. Now, the second equation is c x hat equals d. And I simply plug in this value of x hat and I get this. Um, 
That gives me z. So I know z is minus 2 cc transpose inverse d. Uh, and I plug that into the first equation, and I end up with this. Uh, x is equal to c transpose times cc transpose inverse times d. But that's our friend. That's our c, remember, is wide. And this is precisely the pseudo inverse. So it says that the solution of the least norm problem is the pseudo inverse times the right hand side. That's it. So very cool. Um, so what this says is if a matrix C has linearly independent rows, um, then we already saw, well, a while ago, that's that the that the pseudo inverse of that matrix is a right inverse of C. We already saw that. Um, uh, and what that tells you, you know, is that for any D at all, if you plug in X hat equals C dagger D, that satisfies CX equals D. That's what it means to be, uh, you know, a, a, a right inverse, right? Um, but now we know more. This is a special right inverse. And it is the right inverse. It says that X hat, which is, is, is a, a solution of CX equals D. It's really cool. Now we know it's actually the solution with the smallest norm. So... So it gives you the smallest solution of CX equals D. Um, so it's very nice. Ties a bunch of stuff we've seen together. And of course, you can compute this by a QR factorization on C transpose, right? So um, that's all. So uh, everything sort of ties nicely together.